أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيبنا ونبينا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميامين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, Welcome yet again uh, my beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers to our show um, T3, Teach, Talk and Thrive inshallah As always I'm your host Ali Burji and with us none other But um, our respected and, and highly um, beloved uh, Sayyid uh, Shabir Kirmani Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Sayyidina Inshallah uh, before we begin I'd just like to um, inform you real quick That on the uh, during the second half of our um, program inshallah We will have uh, the lines open for any of you Who would like to join our discussion Contribute or ask uh, the Sayyid a question uh, The numbers will be available at the lower um, bottom of your screens now, uh, we discussed last week about leadership and now we've said as well from the beginning of this program that uh, anything we discuss about, we always take uh, Ahlul Bayt as uh, the base, the role model and uh, the Qibla for guidance and um, wisdom, extracting wisdom and information in order to improve ourselves spiritually, physically, socially, financially. And inshallah, we're going to continue uh, with the topic of uh, leadership. But most importantly, we want to understand what makes uh, a great leader. And eventually, through this program today, we want to understand how we can improve our communities and what role does identifying and choosing, whether it's us or someone else, a leader, a proper leader, plays the significant role uh, in the society as a whole. Uh, inshallah, we'd like to begin, uh, Sayyidina, with uh, the question as why is a leader important in the first place? Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Leadership is an extremely important trait. Um, and it's a very important um, position that is uh, a part and parcel of society. Um, leaders are needed in different fields. They're needed in fields that we've been talking about in the past. For example, they're needed in uh, business and entrepreneurship and, and commerce. They're needed there. They're also needed in politics, for example. They're needed in uh, community development. At every aspect of life, even in a family structure, you need someone as a leader. You need someone, wherever there are humans, you will need a leadership element. Now, leadership doesn't necessarily have to be what you and I may perceive it to be. Leadership doesn't necessarily always have to be just one individual charting a vision, although that is one form of leadership. Leadership could be a group, leadership could be a team, leadership could be an entire entity or institution working together to lead a cause. Um, and leadership can have a face at times, it can have somebody who's at the forefront, or it can be faceless at times. All of these are different forms and facets uh, of leadership. Leadership is, however, extremely important because you have to be able to chart a vision, see down the road, see down the forest, and be able to move people and motivate people and inspire them to look and see towards your vision and help chart a plan to get there. We shed some light of, on this in, the, in past episodes, if not maybe explicitly, but implicitly. And sometimes even explicitly. When we talked about, for example, a leader, sh a leader in, in, uh, in, in one sense is someone who sees a vision for the future, sees where we are today, and looks at how I can bridge the gap. How can I chart and create a bridge from one point to the other and get there? So... For someone who has a business or an enterprise, that may be, for example, how can I grow this business? How can I get more revenue generated? Things like this. For someone who's trying to develop a community, they can try to say, for example, this is where we are today. This is where we're trying to get to. And how do we get there in terms of having impact on our community, doing good for our community, helping people out at the same time? These are all very important components of, of leadership. 
somebody has to chart that vision and help mobilize people to act on that vision. And this is of course what the Ahlul Bayt salam did. This is what Rasulullah did, as we've mentioned in past episodes as well. Rasulullah, he charted a vision for the community, for the early Muslims, where they, but whereby they were willing to go through the persecution. They were willing to go through that difficulty because they saw the end goal, which they saw over a period of 23 years. Of course, the, the early years, the Meccan years, were very difficult for early Muslims. And of course, indeed, for Rasulullah himself, because he was the ultimate leader who was going through this difficulty. I don't think it was very easy. It must have been very difficult for Rasulullah to see the persecution that was happening to his followers. Yeah. People giving their lives in those early days. Yasser and Sumayyah, for example. The, the sanctions that were placed on the Muslims by Shabi Abi, uh, in Sha'bi Abi Talib. Um, the economic sanctions. People starving. That was very difficult for Rasulullah. But this is what leadership does. But leadership inspires people to a better place and a better position. And takes on those difficulties and calamities themselves. Rasulullah took stones, was pelted with stones in Taif when he was trying to bring people to Islam and give them the good news of Islam. Yet he never, he never at any moment did he curse them or anything of that nature. Rather he prayed for them. This is the highest pinnacle of leadership, Rasulullah himself. And who was Rasulullah's number one protege? The person who Rasulullah himself trained, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi That no one taught Amir al-Mu'mineen except Rasulullah. And Rasulullah is that individual that is the only person above Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you want to see the justice of Rasulullah, don't look no further than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. In his form of governorship, and how he instructed others as well. This discussion of, of Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'min, it's inseparable. There is a divine hikmah and it is no coincidence that in Ghadir, in that final ceremony of Ghadir, Rasulullah is stopping all of those who have just come back from Hajj, accepted by all Muslims, Shia, Sunni, doesn't matter, Shia, non-Shia, all accept the final ceremony. And Time and time again, but in the final summer, when they are returning from Hajj, Rasulullah says, Whoever's gone ahead, bring them back, and whoever is, is behind, let them catch up and let us make an announcement. And in that announcement, he says, Man kuntu maulahu, fahada ali maula. That whoever's master I am, Ali is his master. But before that, he said, Alastu awla bikum min anfusik. That do I not have a greater right over you than you have on yourself? To which they also responded, Bala ya Rasulullah. This was an extremely important announcement because it was passing the baton of leadership for the Muslim world. It was none other than leadership. How is it possible that Rasulullah over a 23 year period has established the Muslim empire, he has established the world for the Muslims, the Muslim world, through his leadership. And he doesn't select a leader for, 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 for after him? For when he leaves this world? How is that possible? How does that make sense? And this is the reality of the matter. So leadership is fundamental to Islam. It is through the leadership of Rasulullah, through Amir al-Mu'mineen, that Islam was able to, to thrive. Now, someone may come forward that there was a moment in time where Amir al-Mu'mineen's right was taken away from him for a certain amount of time. Yet this is where we see Amir al-Mu'mineen as his, at his height. That he was still willing to advise those and help those individuals who needed help when they needed help. For the betterment of the entire Muslim world. To see the big picture. This is what a leader does. A true leader of the highest caliber. A true leader of the highest caliber sees the bigger picture and they see further down the forest than anyone else. Someone who's a small time leader. You want to talk about leadership and the height. Amir al-Mu'mini salawatullahu salamu alayhi. A leader who's a low caliber leader says, well, I want the credit. I want this to be me. You know, there's a, there's a very famous quote, I believe it's Ford, where he says that it's amazing what you can get accomplished if you don't care who gets the credit. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit at the end of the day. 
That's very true. And many a times, we're just focused on getting credit at the end of the day. I did this. This was my de- initiative. Mm. This was my decision. So it's always um, thinking about ourselves rather than thinking about the, the either the general whole or, or other the, anything else other than ourselves. Um, Absolutely. But what I wanted to um, discuss with you is what do you think creates this psychology in human beings that when we look uh, let me rephrase when we look at uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and we look at personality like Muawiyah la'anatullah now when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam ruled it was very difficult for him to find loyal people mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. to the extent where uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam would say that I would exchange 10 of mine for one of Muawiyah's followers. Mm. And we know that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam would not overpower the people, would not hold his leadership through fear. He would do that through kindness, through appreciation, mm. through goodness. Mm. But people would not, um, would not appreciate that. That's mm. the thing. But when you had personalities like Muawiyah get in power, everyone would work like, would follow his orders like clockwork no one would dare no one would dare to be disloyal to him because they knew they'd uh, lose their heads straight away so what 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 would it take for a community a people to understand the true value of a leader rather than just um I think maybe fear being the driving force of them um, submitting on the yes. person yes. because of fear. Mm. What would it take for our community to break, break, break free of this, of this shackle, mm. psychological mm. shackle? Brilliant. So the crux of what you're saying is, in essence, is this that Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib's method of leadership and governance was based <coughs> on Justice and adherence to justice and ultimate adala, ultimate justice. On the other side of the fence, as you correctly stated, there were people, the likes of Muawiyah, who essentially, for lack of a better term, he bribed people into submission. There's two very important human emotions that we've mentioned on previous episodes as well. There's something called the fitra of the human being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to in the in the Quran, he alludes, and we have numerous traditions that tell us about human nature. For example, our human nature tells us at some level what, what, what is right and wrong. We know within us that this is truth and this is falsehood. This is good and this is bad. This is bad. At the same time, we have some animalistic urges as well. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us ashraful makhluqat, the human beings, the best of his creation... At the same time, this human being has the ability to be better than the angels, if we choose to be so. And we have the ability to be worse than the animals, if we choose to. Worse not in the sense that animals are bad, meaning the animals don't have the level of intellect that human beings have. And therefore, we can act on animalistic desires and begin to do some of the worst things. For example, in history, as is shown, that many human beings become butchers. They kill innocent people left, right, and center. And you still see this till this day in this world, although it get, gets masked. But anyways, the point being that because Allah has endowed us with intellect and desire, if we control our desire and have our intellect over it, we can become better than the angels. The angels who don't necessarily have the desire to sin. So we have to go over an obstacle and a test. What I'm getting at is fear and greed. These two emotions, they govern the stock market, for example. They even govern business at some level. They govern many aspects of our world. A person like Muawiyah, who used his leadership for not the best things in the world, even our non-Shia Muslims all agree that even Muawiyah, anyone who came against Amir al-Mu'mineen, who stood against Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, was wrong. And they made an error in ijtihad. This is what they say, the, their definition. Even they accept that, that, that they made an error at that moment in time. So there's no comparison between Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the height and pinnacle of leadership, 
and then someone like Muawiyah. But that begs the question: How was Muawiyah able to get people on his side? And you attribute, and you said correctly about trading ten for one. How did that happen? Because he understood the concept that people had in their hearts of fear and greed. That people would begin to say that prayer behind Ali alayhi salam, Ali ibn Abi Talib is very nice. But dinner with Muawiyah is nice as well. So they wanted in spirituality, they knew that this is haqq Ali ibn Abi Talib. But they knew if dunya. we want the world, if we want this dunya, if we want this world, we have to be with Muawiyah. Muawiyah who would buy people for a hadith, for traditions. You know, you find traditions that are seemingly against Ali ibn Abi Talib today. And I don't blame some Muslims who live in today's era and today's time because they are confused. If you go back to history, you'll see why this confusion arose. What would happen? There's various traditions. Muslims, Shia, non-Shia alike, all accept that there are at least, at least 300 verses that have been revealed in honor of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Verse after verse. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ يُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةُ وَيُطْوَنَ الزَّكَاءُ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ For example, very famous verse. Absolutely unanimous, it is for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Muawiyah said, I know, I don't. I, don't, I want this in honor of me or not for Ali or things mm. like this. Change history. You know. They invite the person who is the, the one who is, is narrating the hadith. How much? How much? said, I want you to write this for someone else. And it's not for Ali. I can't do this. It's unjust. It's unjust. 10,000. No, I can't do it. 50,000. No, I can't do it. 100,000. I, I can't do it. Million. You know, the guy starts kind of trembling a little bit. You know, you, you know everyone, they say everyone has a price. He says, fine, here, give me. This changes it takes the money and goes. This is what Muawiyah was able to do. Muawiyah, he wasn't, in one aspect, from one dimension, he was a very astute, he had been given and endowed with a certain level of intellect which he used for evil. He used the intellect that had been given to him for evil. But Amir al-Mu'mineen responds so amazingly. Ali ibn Abi Talib says that if I wanted to, I could beat Muawiyah at his own game. I could defeat him at his own game. Of course. But my principles do not allow me to do this. My ethics don't allow me to do this. My integrity doesn't allow me to do this. And this was, this is an invitation of thought to all Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Ahsan. That how can you make Ali ibn Abi Talib you demote Ali ibn Abi Talib from karam Allahu wajhat, you bring him down to radi Allah ta'ala an. And you elevate Muawiyah to radi Allah ta'ala an. And therefore it seems like Ali and Muawiyah are the same plane. It's an invitation to think for human beings. How is it possible? The one that Rasulullah is saying is my nafs, myself, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Yet this is what's happening. In, in any event, this is the importance of leadership. Leadership, when we talk about leadership Islamically, it's not just about results. Although that's an important aspect of it. It's results with ethics. It's results with integrity. This is why leadership is so important. Leadership is important because we want to aspire to the level of leadership of Rasulullah and Amir al-Mumni Ali ibn Abi Talib the Holy Prophet, and the same level, Amir al muminin and the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, who are at the highest level. We do not want to aspire to the likes of Banu Umayyah in terms of their leadership. Were they leaders? In some sense, yes, they were leaders. They were leaders because they had been given a title by the people. But is that sufficient to have the love of people in, in your hearts? That's what the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam had. How can we... <clears throat> train ourselves in order to appreciate for example during the days of Amir al-Mu'minin salam people wouldn't appreciate him as much as they should like we can see these unique individuals like Maytham al tamar Maqdad Salman al-Muhammadi 
Now, obviously, these were people who truly were aware of the position of the holy imams. And they followed to the last, um, to the... To the to the dot, and it means that they they would never even comprehend of disobeying, or, but yet again the majority of the people, even though for example, uh, as you mentioned, Aidil, the incident of Ghadir Khum, everyone was aware that Imam Ali was the successor of the Holy Prophet even before Ghadir Khum, mm. everyone was aware. Yet they abandoned him. Yeah, and when we want to learn from our mistakes, because that's the whole point why we're here, benefit from the mistakes of our predecessors and improve. So hopefully, eventually, we can start heading uh, towards Siratul Mustaqim collectively. Sure. Now, when it comes to our society, because we said at the end of the day, the 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 main question the main information we want to extract from today's show is how can we increase the level of success in our communities and in order to do that i believe is that we must learn from these mistakes and look at communities how many times we choose leaders for all the wrong reasons Mm. and how can we or where can we start from in identifying the mistakes and fixing them in, in, in a way where we can start identifying who are meant to be leaders and who aren't. And how to choose a leader and how not to choose a leader. Brilliant. So with respect to identifying leaders, I believe the cultivation of leadership, meaning the grooming of leadership and training of leadership must start very early on. We must, as leaders in the community, start to groom our, our, our successors early on, first. Second of all, going before that even, as a leader myself or ourselves, we must have those traits that we've mentioned, we're mentioning, we've mentioned in this episode and in previous episodes. For example, humility. For example, the cause of the greater good, for example, the concern of the welfare of our community at large. We must also not be concerned with individual credit for ourselves. Rather, we must be focused on the ultimate end goal. All of these components are very important. I should not just think that because I have a title, I'm wealthy, or I am a doctor, or I'm an engineer, or I'm a lawyer, or I'm worldly successful, materially successful. Therefore, I should take on the mantle of leadership uh, in this this community or in an Islamic environment, for example. Although I'm not saying that if you are materially successful, you shouldn't be a leader in the mosque. I'm not saying this. I'm saying just because you are materially, that's not, that's not a sufficient reason to be a leader. But there are many people who are successful in the worldly sense, and they're also very sincere at the same time. This is, alhamdulillah, very good. Sincerity is very important, humility. These tra- traits are vital to be a leader. But a team is very important as well in terms of leadership. A single individual by themselves cannot always do it. You need a team, and you also need a sense of ownership amongst the general community in order to ultimately succeed and have a thriving community of the highest caliber. It takes a lot of hard work and effort. And inshallah, if you have all of those components in place, you can expect a thriving community. Ah, Santum. With that big saying, we'd like to pause there, inshallah. Uh, my dear viewers, uh, just please uh, stay tuned. We'll be right with you after a short break. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers Welcome back uh, to our show uh, For any of you who just joined us in You're watching uh, Imam Hussein TV live Our program is T3 Teach, Talk and Thrive inshallah uh, With Sayyid Shabir Kirmani from the United States Now we were discussing about leadership And um, how important is a leader And the... Um, the key note for a successful community, inshallah. Uh, we, before we continue, we have a question, Sayyidna, mm. from uh, one of our viewers. Um, question is, what about a conflict of opinion 
uh, between two different leaders of the same community. So mm. we discussed about leadership and obviously a leader should unite everyone. Mm. But if there isn't one main leader and you've got different different leaders within the community, mm. but we're all under the umbrella of Ahlul Bayt Alam Salam, yeah. Ithna Ashari sect. Yeah. What happens when there's a conflict of opinion? Mm. This is a, a vital question. I believe this question has come on from social media or Facebook. Um, kudos to the, the questioner. This is a really very important issue because we talked about in previous episodes and we, if we haven't made this clear, this needs to be very explicitly clear. Unity amongst the followers of the Ahlul Bayt salam, is vital. Because as long as we are divided, it's gonna be, we're, we won't be able to get, attain, attain the level of success that we need to and we aspire towards. That is the level of the Ahlul Bayt salam. Now, if there are two leaders within an, a congregation, within a community, within a Husayniya, within an Imam Bargah, within a Masjid, and, uh, or any other institution for that matter, uh, and that they have a difference of view, and maybe people are getting split, because if there's two leaders, there's two parties, necessarily, right? There'll be one, one's following one, following the other. Now, the question you have to ask, and I have to ask is, is... Is this difference of opinion, what is the basis of this difference of opinion? Is the basis of the difference of opinion ego, my view versus your view, or is it substance? Is it actually intellectually, rationally a, view, a different view of viewpoint? Now, do I, and I should have as a leader, I should have a humility, a level of humility that say that I'm one leader, this is another leader. On this particular issue, that person is right. I should do. I should accept and follow that person. Unfortunately, we don't see this in our communities. I myself have been involved with communities and community development for many years now. I've been involved with um, with Sunday schools, madrasas, Saturday schools for over a decade. Unfortunately, many times in many communities and in many institutions, and the Shia Muslim community not being an exception, egos get the best of people. This is in our communities and other communities elsewhere in the world. That my view is going to be the one that's supreme, other people's views does, don't matter. And you know what's really unfortunate about these ego battles? What's unfortunate about these ego battles is that the people who lose out are the general public. The people who are coming to learn the message of Islam, the people who are listening to, coming to listen to the majlis, the people who are trying to learn about their religion, they're losing out. Further, the worst case scenario is when people argue and there's a fight in, in the administration and the organization and the leadership of a Sunday school or a madrasa or a Saturday school. Because who loses out? Many times the victims are the children themselves who are coming to learn. So when this comes, when an issue of two leaders have different views, number one, we should strive for unity in the community. Try to proceed in a way that does not divide the community. Number two, when we're dealing with this issue, try to separate the personality from the view. This is a trait that will help you in your community development and your life in general. You know, in sales and in business, one thing that is highly recommended that can help you succeed and I succeed is if we separate the, an idea or a proposition from us as an individual. So for example, if I'm a salesman and someone rejects rejects, uh, declines an offer that I make, keep in mind, they're not declining you as an individual. They're de declining the offer that's being made. It's not you. It's, it's, the, it's the idea or concept that you're proposing. This is very important because many times people deal with rejection. There have been studies on this that have found that rejection, there's a physical, the body takes the response of rejection as physical pain. I've spoken to many brothers, for example, that they've, they've told me that, for example, they've sent a proposal and they've gotten rejected, for example, and vice versa for the sisters. There's a reject, they, they feel not, it's not a good feeling. The mind interprets that as, phys as physical pain. The same with a leader. Sometimes a leader says, this is my view, I made it public, and now if I'm rejected, they don't want, no one wants to go through that. It requires a tremendous amount of humility to be able to do that. When you're dealing with community issues, separate the issue from the personality and try to make an, a, a decision that is most in line with Islam 
it's, it should be aligned with the Islamic perspective and the view of the Al-Bayt Ali Musalam. At the same time, it should also be a view that is pro- practical and pragmatic as well. And we must try and strive to keep and maintain the unity. I tell you, I have had this conversation with numerous scholars, the true scholars, at the highest level, that they even say that if you have some, if you sense that disunity will happen, compromise. And numerous times, the, uh, this was the way of thought of the Ahlul Bayt as well. How many times the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, whenever they could, they would strive for a peace treaty? Sulah Hudaybiyah, the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah, Sulah, the, the peace treaty of Imam Al Hassan, alayhi salam, numerous peace treaties throughout. Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, strive for that. When you're dealing with leadership, try to see, try to, try to work together as much as possible. Don't try to say that I am a follower of this marja and I am right and you're a follower of this marja and I'm and they're right and so on and so forth. Don't try to say I follow this person's banner, I follow this person. We all follow one banner. That is the banner of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawatullah wa salam. We are the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. By virtue of Rasulullah, by means of Rasulullah. And we are we are working for the cause of Imam al-Hajjah. Imam Sahib al-Azim. Ajallah ta'ala kharaja sharif. I could not agree with you more. Um... But the problem is we let ourselves down and we let our communities down. And as you said, um, at the end of the day, the, the general public is the one that suffers. And in this case, when it comes to our communities, it's our generations, our future generations, the young ones who are going to suffer the most out of these conflicts. Yeah. Um, what would be a good initiative, in your opinion, um, to help the people change their mindset? Um, Stop this politicalization of our sect. Stop this um, creation of different boot camps. And as you said, at the end of the day, everyone has his own ego because no one wants to be um, proven wrong or no one wants to lose power, if any, in their disposal, um, influence. Mm. So what, what would a good way to start changing the mindset of our brothers and sisters. Very good. So, to add to your point, it's not just necessarily that we'll lose future generations, although that's true, if we don't get together united and we don't work for that cause, we've already started losing generations. We've already started losing people. I myself have heard many youths say that we don't go to the Husseini anymore, we don't go to the Imam Barga anymore, we don't go to the Masjid anymore. Why? Because this is a place of conflict. This yeah. is a place of argumentation. This is a place of, of, of strife. This is a place of people fighting each other. What's the point? Why should I be here? I'm looking for God. I'm not looking for people. And I've heard this numerous times. The point being that when we see this, how do we strive for this? We see, it goes back to what we mentioned in the previous point, that first of all, we see ourselves as followers of the Ahlul Bayt. We are under one camp. Other Muslims do this. Although they may have much more differences. Believe me when I tell you, they may have much more differences amongst themselves. Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali. You want to talk about differences, you look at the difference between Hanafi and Hanbali, school of thought. Shias, in terms of their fiqh, are much closer to Hanafis than Hanafis are from, than Hanbalis. It so makes sense because Hanafi was a student of Imam Jafar. Exactly. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa was a student of Imam Sadiq. And definitely. And it makes sense. But they all, when they come together, we are Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That's true. And you can't really distinguish. Like if, if uh, subhanAllah, in our community, you could, <laughs> you could tell if a, a Shia is from the uh, A uh, community or B group. Yeah. But when it comes to Ahlul Sunnah, even though they may have different, um, you know, uh, disputing leaders that they follow, you can't really tell. Mm. To an extent, I mean, okay, you can distinguish a, a normal Sunni from a Wahhabi Salafi. Don't get me wrong. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. We are Shia to Ali. That's what we are. That's our identity. That's who we are. Number one. Number two is with respect to to how can we implement this? For example, in the youth, encourage sports amongst each other. Mm. Spending more time together. You don't necessarily always have to be necessarily talking about Islamic things. Yeah. Bonding. Bonding, absolutely. Yeah. There's many people, like, the, the same parallels, when you're trying to unite someone, sh- the bigger goal, the bigger picture is very important. 
And we need to get rid of this mentality of my way or the highway. This unfortunately has become very common in communities. Yeah. Meaning that for example, uh, Habib brother Ali Burji, my respected brother here, and I am Shabir Kirmani, for example. We have views, maybe we align 98% of the things we agree on. But there's 2% that we disagree on. You know, and everyone will start focusing on that 2%. Oh, no, 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 we have to focus on this 1-2%. This 2% issue, That's this true. is the focal point. Whereas in one household, a brother and a sister may not agree 100%. Yeah. Father and son may not agree 100%. No two human beings agree 100% on every issue, on every single issue. Yet we have this notion that if there's a slight difference, we, dis- we say that this person is, is lost, their, they've gone off the wrong path, they've gone off the deep end, fine. Don't talk about those things that will cause friction. Don't, don't necessarily highlight those things and focus upon them. And don't give allegations and start saying this person belongs to and is an agent of this and that and the other. Don't say these things. Because when you start doing this, you start making the people who are confused and don't know, they think, oh, maybe this is true. Maybe I don't know. Or maybe I'll stay away from this person. This is not accepted in Islam. This is, it comes under the fold of tuhma or buhtan. Slander on someone, you're slandering. There's a difference between ghiba and buhtan. Buhtan and azima, the Quran says, that was done on, on Maryam alayhi salam. That not only are they gossiping, not only are they backbiting, but they're saying something that's not even true. And unfortunately, this is, become, this is starting to become the norm within the Muslim world, yeah. within the Shia world. We have the best role models, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. You can't find better. Go, world, go across the globe. Corner to corner, side to side, up, down, north, north, south, east, west. You won't find better leaders than Ahlul Bayt And yet, their followers are divided. Their followers, unacceptable. So we must, first and foremost, look at the big picture and not start to say, my way or the highway. Let's work together. It's about time that we started doing this. It's been too long that we've been separated. Too long. And alhamdulillah, there are people who are working towards these initiatives. There are people who are working towards these causes. But we need to ramp it up more, inshallah. And when we do that, we'll, we'll succeed, inshallah. Ahsan. But that's, that's the thing, it's crucial. Um, changing our ma- mindset that even though I may have a different opinion, me and yourself, I will still respect you. Because mm. at the end of the day, we are brothers, as you said very correctly. And w- how... With regards to the community, when we set a leader, another thing that's quite troubling is that um, uh, we uh, may have that lack of ownership, yeah, or have a lack of responsibility as we think that, oh, we have an appointed leader, that means that everything falls onto the leader Mm -hmm. and we shouldn't uh, take any... um, any, and, and that feel of ownership or uh, liability for our actions. How incorrect is that and how crucial it is for us collectively and individually uh, th- believe that we all have a part of ownership in this greater picture of us as being a big community followers of Ahlul Bayt. It's very important. So this ties in and you're building on, on this question from the previous as well, if I can elaborate from that as well. A lot of issues arise. I talked about my way or the highway concept and these things. At the same time, I should note that as a follower of a particular marja, for example, I should not impose my view on another. This is very important. If I am a muqallid of a certain marja, that, uh, the, the rulings of that marja, that, the fatawa of that marja or hujja on me, they may not necessarily be a hujja on the other uh, muqallid, the one who's following another marja, for example. The same is true, for example, when we have our community uh, issues and endeavors. If I have a view, or my committee has a view, or my team has a view, for example, I must not necessarily impose my view on the other person. However, I can talk in dialogue with them, and try to rationale and reason with them at some level, and some discussion at that, the problem is, do we come with the mindset of understanding and learning from the other? Or do we try to come with a perspective of trying to convince them that I'm right and you're wrong? 
Most times it's the latter. Most times people are trying to convince the other person, you're wrong, I'm right. End of story. And this is, when you have this type of mentality, it's very difficult to succeed and unite and actually work towards a bigger cause. When, when you're not united, you can't get everyone together and work towards a bigger cause. Why is it so important? Because what happens is when you're disunited, and I've seen this in numerous communities across the globe, sometimes you have Husseiniyas that are within a one mile radius of one another. And you're thinking, what's going on here? Within a few, even walking distance sometimes. And you're like, this may be a, a waste of resources at times. I, I'm very cautious to use the word waste, but what I mean by that is, what if those resources were pulled together? And we had one like strong them? community. One strong community. Community and uh, center, which would be, at the end of the day, more beneficial for everyone. As Absolutely. you said, by co causing frictions and divisions, the ones who pay the price is the general public, is the followers. And that, uh, yeah, I agree with you. And that's the tragedy of the matter. That's the unfortunate scenario that we're actually dealing with as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam. You know, if you go coast, if you go across the globe, coast to coast in the in the U.S., for example, you go throughout the U.K., you go throughout the West, the amount of followers of Ahlul Bayt pales compared to the global amount, and the global amount is huge. Imagine if the followers of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam worked together throughout the globe and felt they were one entity truly and were not divided in any way and were not seeming to do, be so and were not causing friction over the smallest of matters sometimes or making an issue that is a substantial issue into such a big, big issue that it divides and breaks it into five, six, six, seven different groups. Imagine. The estimates say that there are over 350 million Shia in the world. If you do the math, 1.6 billion, 1.7 billion Muslims, of that maybe 15, 20% are followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wasalam. That's a substantial number, maybe 400 million. How? How are we divided? How is that possible? The reality of the matter is, we must st hold strong and, and grab the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wasalam. As we mentioned in previous episodes and today I'm repeating, Quran and Ahlul Bayt These are our guides. These are our compass till the end of time. This, these are who we follow. So with respect to how do we unite, how do we get that? It requires us to work together to the point that we do have success. To your question, how do I get success? Now, many times what you notice in communities is there are a few people who take the apparent leadership position. They become the president, the vice president, treasurer, secretary, these things. And over time, many times the community feels like these are the people who are responsible for all the work. This is not the best way to help a community thrive. In order for a community to truly thrive and succeed at the highest level, you need everyone in the community to have a sense of ownership. This word is very important, ownership. Ownership doesn't mean that I feel like I own the place, that this is my property, that I have the right to tell people, you come and you don't, you get out, you stay. No, 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 that's not what ownership means. Ownership in a business, ownership in a community, ownership in an institution, means that whether it's the person at the top or the people on the ground level, everyone feels they have a responsibility to the institution. Everyone feels they have a responsibility to this enterprise, this institution at large. So that means that if I'm somebody who's a part of the community, I shouldn't just feel that I come here and I get and I get and I get and I take and I take and I take. Rather, I should also give. Give does not only mean financially. Give can mean also through my thoughts and my ideas in a respectful way. For example, I write down a note and I send it in, for example and I give some advice, for example, or I stand up and say, this is how I'll help. I remember I talked and I spoke about leadership and this concept of ownership in one of my lectures, that I felt that, that I said that in, in one of the communities I was visiting as a guest lecturer, and I was talking about how important it is to have this sense that I have a responsibility here too. And I, after my lecture, the, the, the leader of the community, the president of the community, he said, Sayyid, it's amazing what you said. I'll give you an example because this resonated with me, the, the, the respected leader said of the community. 
He said, I felt this same thing. Without ever hearing you, I felt this as well, he said. He said, I told my team, my leading team, uh, the managing uh, team, the management uh, team, administration, that I want to test this and I want to show you something. I said, what's that? He said, tonight, I'm going to put a piece of, of, of waste, a tissue paper, on the ground by the entrance of the mosque. And I'm going to watch everyone walk by. I will, let's see if someone picks up the trash or not. And by the way, there was a, a dustbin or a trash can, or as you call it, the rubbish bin, I believe, is situated by the door or very close to where the trash was. And he said, as the night progressed throughout the night, we saw person after person see the trash, see the piece of paper, walk by it, some had the courtesy to move it with their feet, for example. Some, for example, just stepped over it. But by the end of the night, this person told me not a single person picked up that piece not of a paper. Single. Not one picked up that piece of paper and threw it in the trash. Oh. Now, I'm not saying this is every mosque, this is every Hussainia, this is every Mambarga, this is every institution. And I'm not saying this is limited to Muslims by any way. This is a universal issue of institutions. But until and unless people feel that level of responsibility, <coughs> that I have a responsibility as a general member, as a general attendee of this mosque, as the person who's leading it, we will, we will suffer and we will struggle to succeed at the level that we're trying to succeed at. Everyone must have inculcate that feeling of leadership. That the, the person who's leading or the committee or the team that's leading the community, the administration, feels that we can rely on the community at large and the people there. And at the same time, the people who are in the general community, who are the strength of the community, must also feel that they can actually trust and rely on the leadership. And that if they say something, I may be someone who doesn't have the level of societal respect, but I come into the mosque and I say something, I will be heard and I will be listened to. And if what I'm saying is logical and makes sense, it will be implemented by the leadership. But at the same time, I shouldn't just say, this is my idea, you must take action on it. At the same time, I should also say, this is my idea, here is how I'm willing to help you implement it. And if people have this mentality, inshallah, we'll notice tremendous success in our communities with the help of Ahlul Bayt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, just real quick before we end, um, what, what, what in your opinion would be the best way for us to promote um, our brothers and sisters to adapt this mentality? Humility and sincerity towards the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt Humility and sincerity. That I want the best for my community and my society and Muslims at large even if it comes Ahsan. at belittling myself. Excellent. Ahsantum Sayyidina. Uh, no one could have said that better. Ahsantum, thank you so much uh, for your information and uh, the insight. Um, fortunately, again, we have run out of time and uh, we've come to an end of uh, our show for tonight. We'd like to thank you all for being with us and truly hope that uh, it's been as beneficial to you as it has been to us. Uh, with that being said, we'd like uh, from uh, behalf of our entire team to wish you a blissful iftar with family and friends and remember us in your du'as and we'll see you tomorrow inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.